In the months leading up to the riot, the insurgency had taken hold and the Americans were desperate for intelligence to stop the killing of their troops. In September 2003, General Jeffrey Miller, who was in charge of Camp X-ray at Guantanamo Bay, was sent to Abu Ghraib to upgrade interrogation techniques. When Javal Davis arrived, soon after Miller's new regime had started, things were already far from normal. When we took over from the 72nd AP Company, you know, the, the guys were buck naked in this jail cells and had like panties on their head. Like, I've never seen that before. I'm like, well, yeah, why, why are these guys naked? Our company commander was even like, hey, what's going on with all the nakedness? Why are these guys naked? You know, and their, their answer back to them from the other MP company was, hey, this is what the MI got. <laughs> this, is what they, this is what they want. You know, this is, you know, that's how I go, so. Putting MI, or military intelligence, in charge of the MPs was one of General Miller's recommendations, even though it runs counter to army doctrine. Who told you to stress the prisoners out, or who told you to prepare them for interrogation? The, uh, the military, military intelligence um, personnel, they had an analyst, a linguist, and an interrogator. Now their job, they come up with a list of instructions, like, okay, keep this guy up, sleep for two hours, up for five hours, you know, sleep for 15 minutes, up, you know, slam the doors, keep them up, you know, stretch positions, things like that. Nothing inside you thought, I shouldn't be doing this? I mean, of course. I mean, it's morally, I mean, who wants to, well, first off, my, my attitude was, I'm tired. I'm an MP. I'm a combat support MP. It's not my job. I don't feel like going around and make, waking everybody up. I want to go to sleep myself. You know, so some nights, I didn't do what they, I didn't do what they told me to do. That's why, ultimately, I was replaced. You know, I mean, let the story be told correctly. While he spent several months at Abu Ghraib, Javal Davis only spent one week guarding high-value prisoners in cell block 1A, which is where most of the photos of abuse were taken. So what did you do in that week here in cell block 1A? Hit the garbage can, slam doors, throw cold water, play the radio music loud, you know, stuff like that. You know, that's what I did. It just kept them awake, made life miserable. Put the put the the radio up to the megaphone and play heavy metal music for like four hours straight. You know, that's it. Some of the younger detainees, you know, they started liking it. So you see them playing air guitar out of their out of their cell door, you know, and they're like, like yeah. So oh god, I gotta change this. So I changed out that. I tried to put I put in rap music. Everyone loves hip hop, hip -hop music. All the all the youth. So you see them bobbing their heads in the cell. I'm like oh I can't play that. So then I settled with country music. They hate country music. That was the kicker. That worked. Did you get to the point, did you feel that you were turning into a monster? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see, I, mean, I wouldn't say a monster, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could say a monster. I was de totally desensitized. It's like, after after time, over time of being at Abu Ghraib, you know, with your life on the line every day, you just start to not care. I mean, that's pretty much how, how it went. The soldier who was seen as the biggest monster of all at Abu Ghraib was the so-called ringleader, Charles Grainer. This is him on November 8, 2003. The prisoners in these photos are the same people that Javal Davis was convicted of assaulting. These men were suspected of leading a riot in the outside camp, which resulted in a female MP being hit in the face with a brick. This attack infuriated Javal. Everyone was very upset, myself included. I was, that was the last straw. We're eating the same food, living in the same cells. My life sucks just like yours. I'm away from home, you know, and you sitting here, you're trying to take our life, that's it. I snapped, and, and, that's what, and that's what happened. You know, your mind frame, your way of thinking is so jaded because, you know, your life sucks there. You can, your life's on the line every day. You lose control, that's what happened. It happened to anyone.
Javal Davis was charged with throwing his body weight on the pile of prisoners. According to him, it was an isolated 10 second lapse of judgment. You see, if you look at my record of trial, my record of trial, um, exactly what I'm accused of, exactly what I was charged with. Stepping on the finger and toe of the detainee, landing on them with my body weight, getting up, yelling at them, and leaving. Later that night, when Javel had left the scene, the prisoners were stripped naked and ordered to masturbate. Grainer then put the prisoners in formation for a human pyramid. Ken Davis says that Grainer felt he was being compromised and did consult his conscience when he started to torture the prisoners. Grainer actually came to me early in October and had told me that they're making him do things that are legally and morally, he feels are legally and morally wrong. He said that? He did, and that was early October. Late October is when all the pictures, you know, um, a lot of the events started taking place. When people slate Grainer and these seven as monsters, you have to ask yourself, who created the environment for this to go on? Who opened the door for these people, these young soldiers to walk through? Those are the monsters. On November 16, 2003, a few weeks after the torture had begun, Grainer got a commendation from his platoon leader, Captain Brinson. Corporal Grainer, you are doing a fine job in Tier 1. You have received many accolades from the military intelligence units here, and specifically from Lieutenant Colonel Jordan. Continue to perform to this level, and you will help us succeed at our overall mission. For someone, after they've done all this, to get a counseling statement praising the work you're doing on Tier 1A in the hard site, you're not going to stop. You're going to keep going, and you're going to take it up a notch. You're going to take it up a level, especially when you're getting high fives and data boys and, and keep up the great work, you know, from officers of military intelligence and OGA. Charles Grainer is currently serving a 10-year prison sentence. Sir, I, I, you know, I was a soldier, and if I did wrong, here I am. The longest sentence anyone has received for torturing prisoners to death in Iraq is five months. That's actually my prison cell. That's my bed inside the prison cell. Ken Davis came home in early December 2003 to get treatment for an injury. He says he reported the abuses he witnessed to army superiors, but no one took any notice. First, they were just like, oh, really? See a chaplain. Talk to a chaplain about it. Talk to the chaplain about it. And a lot of people, they use psychology on you. Well, it's all your perception. It's how you perceive things. Maybe it's not as bad as what it really is. A few weeks later, on January 14, MP Joseph Darby handed investigators a disc containing photos of abuse. Another three months passed before the scandal became public. I mean, I was sitting eating in a chow hall, and I looked at that CNN, and I, and I saw a picture of me when I was like 16 years old. I'm like, what the hell am I doing on television? And then I saw like the photographs, and I, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my God. When the torture scandal broke, Javal Davis and six other low-ranking soldiers were charged for the abuses. All defended themselves by saying they were acting under direct orders. The army denies this, claiming they acted on their own volition. They tried to say that, you know, we were some uneducated, you know, dumb, poor kids, you know, from like, garbage can USA when it didn't turn out to be that way. It's like I actually do have a brain. I actually do have some intelligence and I wasn't going to just lay down and let the, you know, the government you know, run, run my name in the, in the ground of my family 
or, or lead people astray. It's not going to happen that way. Before Abu Ghraib, Javal Davis had an exemplary record. He was a track and field star at high school, and seeing his leadership potential, his coach encouraged him to join the army. Even though Javal has served his time, he and his family are determined to appeal his conviction. Paul Bergeron is their lawyer. Paul Bergeron is pinning his hopes on the upcoming trial of two dog handlers at Abu Ghraib, Sergeants Michael Smith and Santos Cardona, who were also charged with abusing prisoners. It looks like it's starting to explode from almost the top now. The former head of military intelligence at Abu Ghraib has been given immunity to testify at the dog handler's trial. Paul Bergeron is sure this will expose the entire chain of command's responsibility for the abuses. Because I don't think there's any way in the world anyone wants to know what Rumsfeld told Sanchez and what Sanchez told Jeffrey Miller. Because you know what they told them. We don't care what you do, just get in there and get us information. Mm -hmm. You can kill them for all we care. Treat them like dogs, that's what they are. We don't care how you get the information. Your job is to get the information. And I think that's what you know that's starting to roll downhill. Javal Davis always saw himself as a proud and dedicated soldier. But the way he was treated by the military has left him deeply disillusioned. If I could say something to the decision makers, I'd say you stabbed me in the back, you stabbed a whole bunch of soldiers in the back, you know, left a whole lot of soldiers out there to dry. So that's what I say to my leadership, shame on you. Uh, Andy, since I'm not going to be here, neither is Steve. Uh, Ted... Ken Davis hasn't lost faith in all of America's institutions. But he thinks that by not telling the truth about Abu Ghraib, the military and the administration will pay the price. It was said right in the New Testament, the truth doesn't have to justify itself, because the truth will be known. So it's kind of one of those things where, okay, if you want to lie, go ahead, because the truth will be known, and people are going to see it, and if that's what you're, you want your legacy based on, fine. And there's soldiers that know the truth. We battle with what we battle internally. The war isn't over for us, because inside is, is a fight every single day that we live. Uh, two young Americans with uh, some pretty ordinary memories of their stint in Iraq. Olivia Rousseau both filming and reporting there. Well, all this build-up of gruesome detail about events at Abu Ghraib raises, of course, the ultimate question. Who bears the responsibility for what went on there? How far up the chain of command do we need to go? The commander of the US military police at Abu Ghraib at the time of the torture and abuse was Brigadier General Janice Kapinski. It was part of her overall responsibility for 17 prisons in Iraq. But following the photo scandal and a subsequent army inquiry, Janice Kapinski was relieved of her command and demoted. She's since left the US military and written a book in which she claims that far from stopping with her, the buck goes all the way to the top, to the US Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and maybe even the White House. Earlier today I spoke with now citizen Janice Kapinski.